I'm actually going to start in a passage in 1 Peter. I'll have it up on the screen. Um, and I'm going to start with this. But, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So I, I guess I wanted to start out this morning with like a foundation to say this, this message in, in the writing, what we're going to look at in 2 Corinthians, is written to the church. Okay, to, to those who are believers in Jesus Christ, who are part of this holy race of believers, this uh, royal priesthood, this holy nation. Okay, so that's where I want to start. You are a holy nation. Keep that in mind, to those of you who are in Christ. All right, now I'm going to kind of give some word pictures to hopefully give you some things to think about. Ah, uh, you're going to love this. Think about a pig. What do pigs do? They go to play in the mud, All right? And they, they do that to keep cool, right? And then they get out of the mud and they go over and, and lay down uh, maybe next to their food trough or whatever. They're no longer in the mud, but the mud's on them, isn't it? Okay, mud's still on them. Uh, I was uh, eating dinner in uh, the middle of that this past week, I was just enjoying myself, having a good time talking and conversing with others, and there was a, an 18 month sitting right next to me. Okay, and, and he was eating and enjoying his food, and about, about toward the end of it, he was kind of full and everything, and I was just sitting there talking with his dad, and he reaches over and he touches me. And it's almost like he was petting me. You know, and you know what he was doing. He was wiping his hands off on me, right? Okay, so you, so you get this picture. All right, let me, let me just use these two word pictures in this way. Let's say that you sinned. Maybe you gossiped or you were greedy or envious, envious, or you were selfish. Maybe you were a part of immorality, full of pride. Um, maybe you did some fraud or theft. And maybe it wasn't like just right now, you're not doing it now, but maybe you did it yesterday or a week ago. There's a, some similarity to that pig that was in the mud and now is out of it, but there's still some stuff stuck to him, okay? So think, think about that a minute. Use that picture for where we're going. Or, or maybe like the, the little boy and wiping his hands on me, you didn't sin at all. You're just in the presence of, of something, and it gets wiped off on you somehow. And, and specifically, the way I'm thinking of is, is that we're in the presence of false teaching of some sort. Some type of um, um, maybe false religion, maybe even incorrect uh, philosophy of some sort, right? And you're not, you're not really participating in it, but it's, it's there and you're, you're taking it in. And, and you, may, you hear it. I remember John was talking about how the eye is a lamp of the body, right? And it, things come in through our senses, just like I was touched. Through our senses, stuff comes into us. And we're affected by it. It might be maybe through school. I mean, they're teaching evolution, right? I mean, been doing that for, for decades. Maybe through our, our entertainment, uh, you know, sleeping around in an in entertainment world, that's just kind of normal. That's actually good in, in some settings. That's the way, the way they present it. And we're listening and going through this. Some of our life experiences, we come up to some conclusions uh, that may not be correct either. I, I've, I've talked to several women especially who, because of situations in their life, they think all men are jerks. And so they just throw that category. I mean, I could go into politics, there's all kinds of input we get there. I'm not even going to touch it any further. But our friends may say, oh, you're worthless. Maybe it's a family member. So some type of falsehood, but, but we kind of grab it. We kind of hold on to those things, and it affects us. So whether we've sinned or not, there are times that you may carry in your flesh or in your spirit stains, if you will, of that sin or lie. From God's perspective, I'm going to use a word here, from God's perspective, we're defiled or unclean. Okay, from God's perspective, we're not perfectly holy. I remember, that's why I started. You are a holy nation. Okay, so keep these, keep these things in mind here. So, what I just described 
It, it, I imagine there's a little bit of stirring. Is that right? Is that Sue? Is that? But what do you do with this? How do you handle some of these things? This is the passage we're going to look at, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. We got it up there. And just one verse. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. All right, ponder that a little bit as we pray. Father God, I have been praying over this passage a lot. I've been praying over this moment. Uh, this is where our, your help is needed dramatically, Lord, to, to help me communicate, help our hearts to hear, help us to get what you want us to get out of this passage, because that's really all that matters. So I pray, Father, for you to, to cleanse your church somehow this morning by doing a work in each of us. Give thanks to you, Father, for the scripture and for these people. I love you. I love them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Look at that one more time. I just want to read it. But I want to just stop a little bit short. Having these promises. What he's doing here is he's, he's pointing us to the promises that he just covered in chapter 6. And he's saying, based on those things, there should be some action. Okay, and you see that in all kinds of scripture, where it, a lot of times what we do is we read this and we immediately jump into action mode. We either want to do what he said to do, or, or we want to fight back and say, no, he's not really saying that. But I want you to pause and, and do what he says here. Uh, therefore, having these promises, I want you to ponder what these promises are. I'm just going to look back at 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through 18. Okay? So if you want to look at that with me, he says, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said. And then he's going to quote Old Testament passage. He says this, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons, be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, when we think about promises, we may think about heaven and hell. We may think about, you know, he'll help us in all situations. But specifically what Paul's alluding to here are these promises. That he wants to be among us. And no, he doesn't just want to be. He promises to be among them. And that gets fulfilled in Jesus, where he comes in the Holy Spirit and dwells in his people, among his people and in his people. So us as the church, he dwells in us and among us now. It's not just a promise for the future, it is a promise for now. It is both. And he says he wants to be our father. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me. And he says, I will welcome you. Now, what I want you to do is think about this. Oh, oh, and I said this, because the next word, therefore having these promises, beloved, let us. So what I'm going to talk about next, I want you to kind of hold off a little bit, and just stop right here on these promises. And I want to ask you this question. Do these promises move you? Do these promises do anything in you that, that makes you want to listen more? <laughs> makes you want to, to move into action? Because that's what they're designed to do. In this passage, what he's saying, these, these promises should move you. I can't, I can't persuade you. And I'm not, I don't want to. I don't want you to be moved by me. But are you moved by God's promises? Now, when we were, when I was an unbeliever, when I did not attend church, I didn't know God, I didn't know Jesus, didn't know anything about it, and I, and I was lost. I was, I was destined for hell. Somebody kind of laid out some things, some promises of God that I could actually be saved and enter into His presence and go to heaven. Those promises moved me. And I would imagine those promises moved you who have believed as well. I want what you are offering God, and it moved you to believe. It moved you to, to be baptized. It moved you to, to change some things in your life, right? It's not just for the past, because he's speaking, Paul is speaking to Christians here. He's saying those, those same promises should move you on an ongoing basis, all right? And that's the question, and ponder that. And not just today, but even tomorrow. Think through some of his promises, these specifically, and say, is that moving? 
If that does move you, then the rest of what I have to say has some meaning to you. You'll understand and you'll enter into it. Uh, if, if that doesn't mean anything, if, if those don't move you, then what I say is going to be just kind of bounce off. And I understand that. Okay. Let's go on. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement. A couple things in just that little piece. Cleanse ourselves from all defilement. He said cleanse ourselves. That means you and I can cleanse ourselves. Now, there's, there's a cumulative way of looking at that. Let's cleanse ourselves as the church. But I'm convinced that this is talking individually. From some of the other things that are here in Corinthians, he, he does speak to the group, but he also speaks to the individual. And I think that's what this is. You individually cleanse yourself. Think about that. What Paul is saying is you have the ability to cleanse yourself of all defilement. First of all, he's, he's assuming that there's defilement among you. Which is, which is safe to say for us, right? I mean, I would say that in myself. I would say that in you t as well. It's safe to say we all have defilement of some sort. And we'll look at some of what that is. But he's also saying that you have the ability to cleanse yourself. Okay? Now you've got to walk with me, aren't you, through this? All right. When we look at the word defilement, I, it, this was interesting because in, in my New American Standard, and most of yours will say the word defilement, but in some of the passages, some scriptures, like King James, it says filthiness, and New International says contaminants. Cleanse yourself of all contaminants. Okay, and that's, that's where some of this comes through, is in the definition of this defilements, most of us, and maybe I, we could do this, show hands, but I won't do it, uh, may think defilement means sin. Cleanse yourself of all sin. Stop sinning. You may just think that's what it means. But it's actually more of that. And, and get into the definition, looking at that word, it, it, it's used typically in that way as an action that brings about defilement. What is the act that defile you? But Strong's defines it as a stain. That's why that word filthiness comes in, or contaminant. And that's why that picture of the pig, it's, I did it two weeks ago, but there's still something hanging on. There's some application of that. Or I've been around something that, that got me unclean and, uh, or defiled me. And, and he wants me to, to deal with that. Remember, we're a holy nation. And, and so why I came up with this definition, this is where I'll be coming from in this, is that if this, we're addressing this stain that's left by involvement with impurity, either directly or indirectly. Okay, so that, that helps you know where I'm coming from. Could be the mug on the pig, the food on the arm, or belief in the heart. Okay? I want you to go to Matthew chapter 7. You might turn there. Um, because some of you may have thought of this passage already. I want to make sure that we address the, the words of the Lord on, on defilement uh, specifically. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, just verse 5, Jesus is asked a question. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 7, forgive me. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verse 5 says, The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? Okay, and, and you go back to the Old Testament, and you go to the, to the rabbinical teachings, and you see, okay, their hands are unclean, and they eat, and they're defiled as well. Okay? Now Jesus addresses their hypocrisy, and then he gets down in verse 14, and he answers the question. He addresses this question here. In verse 14 he says, And he called the crowd to him again and began to say to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him, if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears, let him hear. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? <clears throat> because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and it is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. It's a good thing. Verse 20. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. 
For from within, out of the heart of the man, proceeds the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds, coveting, wickedness, as well as all deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things proceed from within and defile the man. Okay? So you, you see how there's a, a complexity to this whole conversation. But Jesus has spoken clearly. It's not just that we've been in the presence. We're not defiled just because we're in the presence of something. Not even just because I got something wiped on my arm. Not because, you know, I'll look at some, some passages that'll kind of elaborate. Again, what, I'm, what I've tried to do is give some word pictures to try to fit this. This doesn't, doesn't work perfectly, as you all know, all these analogies and word pictures and so forth. But I've got some more here. I'm going to go back to 7, 2 Corinthians 7.11. It says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. Now, again, this is... now. Paul, speaking to the church, knowing what Jesus had said, he says to cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. This is where I want to go back to Leviticus. Okay, Isn't that a, that's a fun track? But be aware, what happened in the Old Testament was in many cases physical working out so we can see it to understand better the spiritual reality of now and even in the future. And so we can look at some things that went on in the temple and we can understand better what, what we're dealing with now. So Leviticus 20, 26. I'm just going to tie these two together real quick. Leviticus and Corinthians. Thus you are to be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the people to be mine. Okay, so you get that? And in, in 2 Corinthians it says some, something very similar. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. So there's some similarities here. Leviticus 21, I'm going to get into some real, some law stuff, you're going to love this, okay? So, so bear with me, but, but get the pictures in your mind. Uh, 21, 1 through 6, then the Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, you are a royal priesthood, remember that? That I read out of Peter? There's, there's ties here. Um, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, no one shall defile himself for a dead person among the people. So this is a, a defilement of the priest just coming into the presence of a dead person in Old Testament. Okay, so you get the picture of, they didn't do anything wrong. They just came into the presence. But from God's perspective, there's a defilement that's gone on there. He said, don't, don't do that. Okay, he goes on down later in verse five, he says, they shall not make, talking about the priest again, they shall make, not make any baldness on their heads, nor shave off the edges of their beards, nor make any cuts in their flesh, they shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of the God. So you're getting a picture of physical defilements. Okay? I'm, I can go down in Leviticus 19.28. You shall not make any cuts in your body for the dead, nor make any tattoo marks on themselves. I am the Lord. Now, probably at least half of you in this room have tattoos. Okay? So I'm not speaking against tattoos. Make sure that's really clear. Okay? Because if I was going to do that, I'd have to go to the verse right before that and say, I've cut my beard. I'm in violation too, okay? So, so bear with me. But what you will see in that passage is specifically, what, I know people who cut themselves. What are they trying, typically trying to do nowadays? They're trying to deal with pain. They've got emotional pain, and they'll cut themselves to try to deal with that emotional pain. And, and, and it, whether it be that reason, or in this case, he says, they cut themselves for the dead. Whatever the reason, he's saying, don't do that. Okay? So we get some physical defilement that God is referring to here, okay? And all this comes back. I mean, in, in all of this physical defilement, it can come into other things that harm the body, like immorality, drugs, even unhealthy foods, okay? It can, it can be pretty big. The, the reason this all matters is 1 Corinthians six nineteen says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Okay? Do you see the seriousness that we're talking about? Now, it gets really weirded out when you get a lot of rules, right? But, but try to put those aside and, and, and enter into the, allow the scriptures and the Lord to speak in your life. That's talking physical that I've talked about. The defilement of the flesh. What about the defilement of the spirit? Here's Leviticus 20, verses 6 to 7. As for the person who turns to mediums and spiritists and play the, plays the harlot after them, I will also set my face against that person and will cut him off from among the people. You shall consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord 
your God. He goes on in Leviticus 19, which is actually before that. He says, do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I, the Lord, I am the Lord your God. Okay? So he, he's, he's getting out. There's something where they were seeking inside them. They're seeking something inside. It's not physical. This is more spiritual. It's more inside of them. It is now getting defiled by seeking out. Anytime we seek or, or are allowed to move inside of us by false gods, false religions, false philosophies, do you get the word false? There's a defilement. The, the whole idea is uh, def, there's, there are things that don't mix with God. God is holy. And there are things that just they don't, they don't go together. And you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. There are some things in you that just should not be there. Because God is holy. We have, we have falsehoods spoken to us in, 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 in words and in images and in all kinds of things. And like I said earlier, they get in through our senses and they, they do not defile us, do they? Jesus made that clear. Just by being in the presence of that does not defile. You can, you can watch a movie and you're not automatically defiled by watching that movie. What, what I'm talking about is, is you might have some mud sticking to you that Paul is saying you need to, be, you need to cleanse yourself of. Because what happens is things get put into your mind and into your heart and you start believing them or doubting God's truth or questioning God's promises. And that's when it comes out as, as a sin and a defilement. Okay? That, those are the kinds of things. In Psalm 51, here's just a thought from God. Behold you, talk, talking to God, behold you, God, desire truth in the innermost being. So defilement of the Spirit inside of our innermost being, God is concerned about. Proverbs 20, 27, the Spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching the innermost parts of his being. All right, before I go into how to cleanse yourself, okay, we are going to get there eventually, I want to go jump to the end of this passage. He says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness. It, it appears in this passage that cleansing yourself from all defilement will perfect holiness. Remember I said you are a holy nation. How did you get to be a holy nation? The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ being applied to you. Right? You've, been, you've entered into His family. You are a holy nation. But, he, but Paul is saying here there's still defilements among you. Let's perfect holiness by cleansing yourself from these defilements. Okay, so that makes, makes sense that there's a, there, there's an, a level of, of holiness we have not experienced because we still have defilements in, it, in us, on us. And he's saying, take it to that next level. And, and there's, there's all kinds of, of effect of that. Because think about when God says, I'm holy, the biggest reason you would want to uh, cleanse yourself to perfect holiness it's because God's holy. It's the right thing to do. Does that make sense? It's not because of some benefit or some cause and effect. It's just because God is holy. The, the, the defilements and God are not compatible. So, so he's calling us to cleanse ourselves, perfecting holiness. Now, I, I think there's, there's clear that when we have guilt from our sin, that's, that, that's part of that mud that's sticking to us, are we hindered from going to, to the Lord? If, if, we don't, if I don't love my wife, it says my prayers will be hindered. You see, there's a fellowship effect of this, this, this stuff that lingers on. And he's saying, there's a relationship that is beyond. All, this, all the promises that God gives right here are, are elevated, and you experience more by the closer and closer you get to God. This is, this is amazing. Now, and, the, and the picture of this is the priest standing in the temple, and he goes into the Holy of Holies in the presence of God. It's that kind of, kind of picture. And, and you're going to have to ask the question, can we be holy? Can we, you know, and you've got to ask that question, am I really a holy, part of this holy nation? Your, yourself, you've got to ask that question. And, and is that true, what I said about when, when a person applies the blood of, of Jesus by receiving his gift to you, are you into that nation, into that family? 
but also can you perfect holiness by something you can do? Those are challenging thoughts that I've had to wrestle with, but I'm wrestling with what Paul wrote here in the command to do so. Cleanse yourself from all defilements, flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. First Peter uh, 1 says this, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And, and I, I like the passage in 1 John, you, most of you will know this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, and it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we're cleansed from all unrighteousness, are we not holy? And we do that initially when we come to the Lord, correct? But it should be an ongoing practice. That's what Paul is saying. Yes, you're in here, you're a holy nation. Now walk in it daily and apply the same thing. Very good. Very uh, foundational things to be practiced. Here's Hebrews chapter uh, 10, because I brought up the priest. This is what the, the kind of confidence we should have. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Did you get that? We don't get the confidence to enter into the holy place, into the presence of God, because we're good. Don't hear me saying that, because that is not what I'm saying. We enter into the presence of God because of what Jesus did, by his blood, without question. Okay? All right, I'm going to go on. But, but by a new and living way, which is inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart. There's that heart part. Sincere heart, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean with, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering because he who promised is faithful. Right? God says, in, through Paul here, he says, cleanse yourself of all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. And then he says, in the fear of God. I want you to take, take this picture further. Um, there were two priests at the very beginning of setting up the tabernacle. And, and Moses gave them instruction from the Lord. And those two priests, who are the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, some of you will know those names, they come and they go in and they offer uh, fire, a sacrifice. They, they go in and what they do, here's what it says in Leviticus chapter 10, it says they offered strange fire. And basically what it was saying is, which, had not, or which God had not commanded them. God had not told them to do that. He, basically, they did it in a way differently than what God said in the Holy of Holies. And they died. Fire came out and consumed them. They died. Okay? It's recorded there in, in Leviticus 10. Now you go a little further in Leviticus 16, and now Moses is instructing Aaron. Okay? The father of these two guys that just died. And he's get, Aaron is getting ready to go back into that same, same temple. And God gives him, through Moses, God gives him instruction on how to go in. And I want you to listen to this. Just listen to the details of this. Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, with the bull for a sin offering, ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on his, his holy linen tunic, and the linen undergarment shall be next to his body, and he shall be girded with a linen sash and attire and linen turban. These are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on and then enter in. Now, what I want you to get, can you imagine the fear? Fear of the Lord on Aaron? His two sons have just died walking to the same place because they didn't do it right. So what's the fear of the Lord going to do in Aaron? It could make him bold. But it doesn't. What it does, it makes him pay attention to the details God's laid out. And he does this. He does these things that he is told to do. He does, puts on, he washes, and then he steps in. And that's what God has said in Hebrews, that we're supposed to come in confidently. But Paul is bringing in, in the fear of the Lord. We, we can't just do this flippantly. We can't make up the rules. We can't offer some strange fire in our lives to the Lord and accept, expect Him to be okay with it. He's holy. And that's what Paul's laying out. And this holy nation that we are in Christ Jesus does not change. He's saying, go to that next level. Get rid of all defilement. We do, we 
have used that same wording when we take the Lord's Supper. We're going to do that in a little bit. Right? We say examine ourselves because that's what he says in, in 1 Corinthians. Examine yourself. And then we say do that, address it, make plans of what you're going to do, and then take and eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus. It's the same kind of thing. So let's get to the how, to how to cleanse. The first thing is probably what we all thought about when we thought about defilements. Stop it. If sin is the thing that is defiling you, and you're doing it, then stop it. Right? I mean, okay, that's... that's some, I, I used a, a financial thing. If you're trying to get out of debt, the first thing you got to do is stop borrowing. Right? You cut up your credit card, right? That, it's that kind of simple, simple kind of thing. It's not that easy, I know that. Right? We, we've been in that conversation before. Here's some passages. 1 Corinthians 6. These are just a couple. And immorality is maybe the, 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 the most obvious one. He says, flee immorality. So if you're going to cleanse yourself from all defilement, you flee. See, what we tend to do is we say, God, cleanse me. But, but God is saying, you cleanse you. And here, I'll tell you how. Just like the priest. Here, put these garments on, do this, do this, do this. He's telling us to do the same thing. He's given us instruction on how to cleanse ourselves. Now, are we cleansing ourselves? No, he's cleansing us. How's he cleansing us? By us doing what he told us to do. It's kind of fun that way. All right, so listen, but listen to the rest of this passage. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? That's a, that's a, a defilement of the flesh, right? It's pretty clear there. And he tells you what to do. Now, now, I can go into don't cut yourself or, or get unholy tattoos or hairdos or clothing. Right? Don't do those things. Don't get those uh, unholy things, ungodly things. Okay? Now, did you hear me say hairdos? That means there are ungodly hairdos and godly hairdos? Where does that come from? From your heart. Remember, it's, the hair is nothing, but what's the motivation that did that? Those are the things, that's, that's why you're, you're addressing inside. It's not just these outward things, although they show up on the outside. Okay? He says to separate yourself. And we talked about that in 2 Corinthians 6. It came up a couple of passages we've already looked at. There are times you just need to get away from sorcerers and, and spiritists, right? Because that's, that's that kind of thing that was in the, uh, in the Old Testament. But... All that false religion, that false teaching, false philosophies, sometimes you just got to get away from it. Right? You just got to, okay, I'm not going to hang out with that anymore. I'm not going to watch that. I'm going to listen to that. That's, that's going to happen. You need to do that. You need to shut some of that stuff off. Clearly. That's how you cleanse yourself from those things. But we also know that there's times we can't. Daniel, I love the Daniel, Daniel story because he's, he's, he's forced to go into Babylonian college, right? Learn all their literature and all this stuff. So what's needed there? And for most of us in most of our life is godly discernment. You have to be filtering that garbage as it comes in. You've got to realize you're getting garbage in. And some of it you're, you're unintentionally grabbing a hold inside your heart. And it's welling up in there and then it's going to come out in certain things, certain actions that are defiling. So there's got to be a discernment of what's coming in. And that's, we've been talking about that in a lot of different ways. So, but this is the idea. How do you cleanse yourself from those things? Filter it. But also you've got to say, I know what's in there already. I know there are things in me that I believe that are not true. Whether it be about me or about God. There, there's almost a search and destroy mission that should be going on if we're cleansing our friends. If we're serious about this stuff, start looking for those. What do I believe that's not true? Start testing the things. God's truth is a big boy. It can stand up to any of your testing. God's truth can. But look for those things. And it's not, you know, there's a boogeyman behind every rock. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to take this passage and say, Lord, you're holy. I'm not perfectly holy. I'm among a holy nation. But you want to perfect holiness by me cleansing myself from these defilements. Um, I, I think, let me go back to more physical things, okay? Because I've, I've seen this worked out in our church. Uh, I'm going to specifically mention a gal that had tattoos she had put on before she was a believer. And they were ungodly tattoos. She knew it. I didn't, I mean, I didn't point it out. She was the one who figured that out. She came to the Lord and she said, wait a minute, these don't fit. Okay, well, what do you do? You get them removed. 
In her case, she got them covered up. You, you can't, there, there's, that's the part of cleansing. There's sometimes you've got to go through some, to some bizarre steps of doing uh, whatever. I've had people in this congregation change their hairstyle because they recognized of what it was coming out of. Okay, so, so be aware and, and allow yourself to go. I, and it's not, you know, basically what you're doing is you listen to God. God, is there anything that I'm doing out of my heart that is coming off as unholy, defiled, to you and change it. That's what he's calling us to. Um, let, me, let me touch on this. You remember, or have you ever been in a situation, I, I use this example, uh, Jacob, if you got up and you went over to Jenny's purse and you stole 20 bucks out of her purse, does Jesus' blood cover that sin? Yes, it does, absolutely. And so he could say, Jesus covered my sin. I'm good. And he'd be right. But what should he do? Yeah, he should give the 20 bucks back. He should apologize to her. He should confess it. You know, all the, all the things that we know should be, should be done. Uh, there's a passage in, uh, in Luke 3.8. I think it's in Matthew 3.8 as well. I thought that was pretty bizarre. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That's what I'm talking about. When I think about there are some sins that kind of leave mud on you. And I think this theft is a good example of that. There's more than just, uh, just accepting Jesus' blood. God wants you, God wants you to make it right. And I, Zacchaeus is a great example of that. There wasn't a command of what he should do, but he said, I'll give four times as much back. Right? He's given half his, way, half his profits or money away, and I'm going to go, if I've defrauded anybody, I'm going to give him four times as much. Okay, so that'd be 80 bucks. Okay. All right. I think you get the, the, the principle here that, that there's more. And, and that idea, there, keep, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Let me say, this is not all about what God sees. It is predominantly, our concern here is with God. Okay, if he's looking down and he says, that's unholy. That matters to us. It should matter to us. But it also, this has effect within the body. Okay? Any, of carrying these things around and not repenting properly, if you will. It's going to help the body by doing this fully. Perfecting holiness is going to be good for us. It's going to be good for our community. It's going to, it's going to give God a better name. It, that sounds weird. Because God's name is great anyway, but it's... Us, we're going to represent his name better. How about that? Okay? Keep those things in mind. We are a holy nation. I want to say one more thing, and I, and I think this kind of puts all this in per perspective. Jesus said when he was washing Peter's feet, and I heard somebody praying it. I think you were praying it this morning. Jesus said when, and Peter said, no, you don't, don't wash my feet. And, and Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. Je Peter then says, wash all of me. And Jesus replied with this. He said, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but he is completely clean. And, that, and that's the idea. I, want to, I keep bringing up this. We're a holy nation. If you've come to Christ, you've placed your faith in him, you're completely clean. But as we're walking along, just as the, the priest would get defiled by a dead person or by something else or his own sin, there are times we've got to wash our feet. And that's what we're talking about. We're, we're cleansing ourselves as Christians, as, as believers in God's kingdom, we're cleansing ourselves of defilement of flesh and of spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And it brings glory and honor to God. And, and let's, let's learn how to stop being pigs that keep going back to the mud. Okay, amen? Um, join me in prayer. Father, I thank you for these passages. I, Lord, I, I love what you do in my heart as I, as I prepare. And, and I, Lord, I don't know how I communicated it. Um, Lord, I pray that you would take what has been said and, and you would work in each individual heart to your glory and honor, to your purpose, to the good of this church and to good of your name. Holy God, um, I, I can see the benefit of what you're saying. And I can also see the incompatibility of any type of defilement because you're just so holy. And uh, that's your calling on me, and I, and I desire it. 
I pray that everybody in this room is moved by what your promises are to us. And we, we, we're so moved that we move, are moved to action. We give praise to you. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.